So today we are going to continue on in our DIY series, Being Disciples Who Make Disciples. I kicked off this message series a few weeks ago, and in it I talked about what I felt was the state of the church in America, and I contrasted being an arena-type church versus being a disciple-making church and the desire of Journey Church to be a disciple-making church. Now, we had a special guest with us last week. Was anybody excited to see Brinson here last week? It was great having him here. And he kind of helped get into the meat of our series. And there was something that I forgot to introduce to you at the beginning of the series, an acronym that I'd love to bring to light during the course of the series, CLOSER. Our desire in the series is that we would grow closer to God. C is for communicate, which is what Pastor Brinson talked about, communicating to God in prayer. Learn and obey is what I'm going to be talking about today. Next week, we're going to be talking about storing up God's word in our heart, how we can get deeper into his word and understand it more. We're going to end out and round out with two sessions, evangelize and renew. So that's how the series is going to look over the next couple weeks. And really, it's a very practical series. We're trying to put action to our faith is what this series is actually all about. We're going to study these things that are very, very practical with the hope that we would apply them in our everyday lives and see spiritual growth as a result that would also turn into sharing our faith with others. Would you go to the Lord with me in prayer as we kick off today's message? Father, you are our daddy and we thank you for being a good, good father one who guides us, one who directs us, one who teaches us, but also one who challenges us to obey in the most healthy of ways. Lord, for our own good, for your purpose, that we could experience the joy that you set before us. And today as we open up your word, let it not be just to gain knowledge, but Lord, that we might be able to apply your word in our lives and be transformed, having do so with the hope that we could also see others transformed for your good and your glory. We ask you to meet us in this place, Holy Spirit, to be our teacher, our guide, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So I want to kick it off with a couple of analogies today. And the first one is a work-related analogy. At some point in our life, we all probably go to work, right? So um, when you think of work, there's different kinds of companies that are out there. There's some good companies, there's some bad companies, and there's some great companies. In a good to great kind of a company, they would have a mission statement. They would have a vision. They would articulate that to the people who are part of the organization. You would understand your unique purpose on your team within your organization. They would inspect what they expect in a healthy way. You would have a job description that you could understand and be able to apply in your workplace, and your workplace would hopefully be one that is life-giving and fulfilling, and that is my prayer for you, that you would work in that kind of a work environment. There's other kinds of work environments, though, that are maybe not so life-giving when we think about them, right? They, all, they might also have a mission, vision, values that are articulated, and they have a set of rules and a job description that you would go and attempt to implement in your life, but they would enforce it in ways that maybe aren't the most healthiest, right? They're looking for you to do bad so that they can whack you one the second you do bad, and they create this toxic work environment where you got to work, 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 and that's all you're there for, and hopefully, if you don't, not hopefully, if you don't produce, then guess what? You're out of there, right? There's some uh, organizations that actually look great, even on the surface, that we might enjoy every day in our environment now, like, say, Amazon, right? It's impacted all of our lives, not as workers, but generally as consumers. I read about some stuff within the organization internally, though, that was a little bit disturbing to me. One of the things that they're doing now, or, or one of the things that's been said, is that they have very high performance standards inside of Amazon's warehouses, and that if you don't meet those standards, then you get bonked, and then in terms of that, you could also get terminated by it. Um, so there's workers that are actually afraid to go to the bathroom in the warehouses because if they go to the bathroom and they take too much time to go to the bathroom, then they might not meet their performance standards, right? That doesn't seem like the funnest place to work. Like some of you are like, I was going to put my application in there, but now I'm not going to go over there on 103rd. <laughs> And it's and another new, new thing that's out there. They actually have artificial intelligence bots at Amazon that monitor your work performance and you could get fired without any human intervention. How crazy is that? 
That's the world that we're starting to move into that we all need to become aware of and be cognizant of how things are changing. So I described to you two different work environments, one that you may want to work in, one that you might not want to work in, and I'm going to start relating those back to spiritual things in just a second. The second analogy I'd love to give you is one of family, right? Um, Each of us grew up in different kinds of families. Some of our families were toxic. Some of our families were non-existent. Others of our families were good. And good families, you attempt to set down good, loving rules that are administered with grace and not always by force, right? So you would have a loving family where you would teach a child as they're young, don't go touch the stove because if you touch the stove, you're going to get hurt, right? A loving parent would do that. A non-loving parent would wait for them to touch the stove and just laugh afterwards, right? That would not be good. It's a not loving parent, right? Um, and then other envir- environments at home, maybe your, your father or your mother was a dictator around the house and they were mean and they had this set of rules that you could never live up to their particular standard and they would beat you down if you didn't live up to them and there was very little grace inside of the house and that's not a healthy extreme either, right? And then at the same time, there's this new stuff I've been reading about, and I'm glad I'm not a parent at this particular stage in Jesus' name, but there's this stuff called free-range parenting that I just cannot understand. If any of you are familiar with that, apparently you give your children free-range to do whatever they want to do, right? You might enjoy it, but everybody around you hates you in Jesus' name. They just hate you. They're like, what is wrong with you? Get your kid under control in Jesus' name, right? So there's these extremes that we could go to, and in a spiritual sense, there's extremes as well, right? There's this extreme grace camp where you can do anything you want to do and sin all that you want to do because your sins are under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and all your sins are covered. And sometimes that grace camp takes it a little bit too far. And then there's the obey camp. You better obey. You better do what I say. And if you don't, then guess what? Many people outside of Christianity think that God walks around with a ruler and is an old nun and slaps you on the finger every time you do something wrong, right? So there, there's many of us who live that way. We live in fear that, guess what? God is there to whack us one whenever we do something wrong. And I'm here to reassure you that that is not the case, that God loves you and he cares for you. As any good dad would, there were times in my children's life where they made some mistakes. None of y'all ever did that, did you? Some of our kids, they were great at certain seasons of their life. Other seasons of their life, they were you know, terrible or they were caught in different things and it was very difficult. But guess what? As a father, I always loved them. I didn't always like them for that particular moment in time, right? But I always loved them. And your heavenly father is the exact same way. When you do things that are outside of his word, when you do things that are outside of his will, there's no doubt he grieves in his heart, although he already knew you were going to do those things, right? But it still grieves him, but he's not standing there to whack you. Scripture tells us, like with the prodigal son, he's there with open arms waiting for you to return. He's waiting for you to repent. He's waiting for you to come home. And the quicker we can do that and obey his word, the quicker we run back into his loving arms, the more love and joy we experience. So God seasons our life with both obedience or the desire to be obedient, but also with love that is filled with grace at the same time. And it's the perfect mixture that we're going to explore today. You see, God doesn't want you to obey him simply because you have to. He wants you to obey him because you love him. And we'll describe the nuances and differences between that in just a couple of moments. Let's start, though, with this concept of obey. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 3, says this, And by this we will know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. So why would he want us to keep certain commands? Good fathers help set good boundaries in our life so that we know what's safe and what's not safe, right? That good father I described earlier that taught his child not to go put their hands on the oven was a good father trying to prevent their child from burning themselves. A bad father would ignore that and allow them to touch them so that they would get burned, right? So God, in the same way, sets up boundaries in our lives. See, right now in our culture, they're trying to tell us that certain family values that God established in his word are no longer valid in our culture. But I'm here to tell you that they are. See, God said sex should be between one man and one woman in the state of marriage for a reason, right? Because when you do things in God's order, there is 
is peace and joy and comfort in the midst of that. For those of us who have violated those principles, you quickly come to know that when you do things out of order, there's often pain and regret that are associated with it, is there not? So he gives us these established boundaries, encouraging us with all love to put them into practice, having grace on us when we fall short. But again, that grace should be no license to sin. Because when I was at a sinful point in my life, somebody walked up to me and said, guess what? His grace is sufficient for you. And I use that as a license to sin. That is not what God wants from our lives. His grace is not a license to sin. His love causes us to desire to not sin, to obey his word. Is this all making sense to you today? So how do we come to this place to know God that we understand his will that we might put it into practice in our lives? Because if we just say obey, guess what? The rebellious nature in me says, heck no, right? But listen to what it says, John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. So why does God put boundaries into place? So that your joy would be full. But in our human minds, in our own sinfulness, we think of boundaries as boring or something to cross. When it says the speed limit is 55, how many of you just want to go 56 just for the heck of it, right? I mean, like, I'm going to go 56 just because they're telling me I can't do that. There's this rebellious nature that resides in the majority of us, right? If we go back to our earlier analogy, if there is a company that leads its workers by fear, they will generally get a momentary performance increase that will not last. If we lead our families by fear, you will generally get them to conform for a period of time, but ultimately it doesn't end up all that healthy, does it? Some of us grew up in those homes and maybe some of you have perpetuated that aspect in your home. Guess what, it's not too late to repent. It's not too late to ask God's forgiveness. It's not too late to forgive someone who wronged you or ask for forgiveness from someone you wronged. That's what God would do to release us, to bring us back to that state of joy. Don't hold on to that any longer. Forgive and in so doing also be forgiven. So what Christ is describing here is an obedience that comes out of knowing him and loving him because he first loved us. An obedience that would at times cause us to forego certain things in the natural that we deem good for the greater good of knowing and loving him. What do I mean by that? Let me compare and contrast a couple of relationships. Say that you are wanting to get married or about to get married, right? And if I were to approach Mary Jo and said, hey, Mary Jo, I kind of really like you. You are so cute. It is fun hanging out with you. Um, but I kind of liked your best friend more and she rejected me. So you're my second choice. But could we still get married? How do you think she would like that do? You know, we wouldn't be married today, would we? What would you, what would you ladies say? Would you give them that? You give them, you'd smack them, would you not, right? You'd be like, get out of here, right? But on the contrary side, if you love someone and there's things that you need to conform to, you will often give way to your own preferences for the purposes of the one you love. So in very small ways, like I love to watch like cop shows. I mean, I, I love to watch the cop shows, be it some drama on TV. Blue Bloods is the best show on television in Jesus' name. It is just the best show some of the, I didn't, I didn't hear one lady chime in on that one. I didn't hear one lady chime in on that one, right? So I love those kinds of shows. My wife, out of a love for me, will often watch cop shows, and geez, isn't she just amazing? She is just absolutely amazing. She will watch those shows. Y'all didn't sound too enthusiastic about that one. For 30 years. For 30 years. <laughs> In contrast, there is this channel that I just cannot relate to called the Hallmark Channel. And apparently, I read online that the Hallmark Channel has filmed 42 different brand new Christmas shows that they're gonna be revealing this year. Like five guys clapped and all the ladies are like, yes. Out of a love for my wife, I have no doubt I will be watching some of the Christmas marathon on the Hallmark Channel, right? 
even though every show has the exact same script. They just mix the actors, right? So there'll be one lady that's troubled and maybe has a single child and they're, they're, she's a single mom and this cute guy will come up and then all of a sudden they'll chance meet, but no, they can't meet, so they gotta separate just a little longer. And then all of a sudden they'll come together under the mistletoe and they'll kiss and then they'll live happily ever after. And that's every single Hallmark show, right? Is it not? And you ladies still love it and are clapping. There's something wrong with all of you, something wrong with all of you. But, you know, we love our spouses, so we will do things that maybe aren't our preference because we love them, right? In the same vein, when it comes to more serious issues, if we're deeply in love with our spouse, the thought of going and cheating on them doesn't even register because we love them and want to bless them and want to be there for them. So we deeply love something. When we deeply love something or someone, guess what? We will obey, not out of a sense of have to, but man, I guess get to obey because man, the Lord is in me. I love him. I love them. Praise you, Jesus. Do you understand the distinguishing facts between the two of those? Lord, help me when Hallmark season comes around. Please, Lord Jesus, help. Hallmark's coming up. All right, switching gears for just a moment. The call on the life of every believer and the Great Commission says, Matthew 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to what? Why do you guys say that so soft? I mean, like, first service did the same thing, right? We don't like that word. It's just inherent. We don't like it. And teaching them to what? Obey. Obey everything I have commanded you, right? So this sense of discipleship is linked with obedience, but this obedience that comes out of love and grace. So I think we're really beginning to understand the difference. So this next verse is what I pray that the Lord would implant on each of our hearts that would give us this desire that was Ezra's desire in Ezra 7.10. For Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, right? So how do we know God's will? We need to know his word. We need to spend time with him in prayer. We need to spend time with him in the community of other believers. We need to learn who he is and allow him to be at work in our lives. And when we know him and when we love him, it is easy to obey. We want to obey. We get to obey, right? So the starting point is spending time with God to get to know him, just as we did, many of us, with our spouses. You didn't have to tell me to pick up the phone and call her back in those days. I couldn't wait to pick up the phone to call her, right? Because I loved her and I wanted to hear about her day. I wanted to know her more. So I spent time getting to know her. You can all relate to that experience. Can you not? God is the same way. He wants that kind of a relationship with us. So we need to study God's word. Second Timothy 2 15 says, study to show thyself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. But Eric, I can't understand the Bible. Many of you have said this at different points in your life, have you not? Maybe even I said it. I need someone to teach me, I need someone to show me. Yes, that may be true to a degree, but guess what? When you go back to the originating people that he wrote it to, they were fishers and tax collectors. Not one of them had a PhD. The Bible hadn't been fully written. He wrote it in as plain of language as he could so that as many people as possible could understand it. The only one that was a PhD, so to speak, that came after was Paul, but he wrote the words inspired by the Holy Spirit in such a way that we can all understand. Even more so, the Bible says that we who are believers in Jesus Christ, the second we give our lives to him, are filled with the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Word of God, who part of his job in our lives is to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, to correct us, to nudge us towards what is right and true so you can open up the word of God and say, Holy Spirit, would you be my teacher, my guide, and illuminate God's word to me today that I could put it into practice in my life. So the big problem is not understanding the Bible in our generation. The big problem is opening the Bible. We live in a day and age where the Bible is more available to us than any other time in human history. There's the Bible and books about the Bible and commentaries about the Bible and this about the Bible and that about the Bible. And we live in a free country, so to speak, where we get more information about it. We have more information at our fingertips about God than at any time in human history, yet we don't open our Bibles. Everybody gets real quiet today because we all know it to be true, even myself, right? The world and social media and the systems of this world are training us not to study God's word. They're training us to be headline readers. 
where the most that we can absorb is the verse of the day, right? And there's nothing wrong with that, but God really wants us to go deeper than that. If you want to know him, you got to go deeper than that. You got to spend time with him. You got to eat dinner with him. You got to hang out at the table with him. You got to celebrate with him and be there with him, right? So how do you go about that? Let me tell you a quick story first. And and catching somebody doing good, it was pretty fun um, this week. I was in Green Cove Springs and I was attending a meeting down there and then I had to come back to the church to be here at 11. And a friend of ours has a marina on Fleming Island that's right there on the water. And I wanted to check on the progress of it. I knew that they were doing some things around there, cleaning it up. And I said, let me go swing by there. It was raining just a little bit. And I pulled up to the gate outside of the marina and there's a building there that kind of blocks the view. And one of the oddities that I noticed was there were some tire tracks that were there on the, the ground. And I was like, wow, who's passing? the gate. Somebody's been here because it's raining. You can see that they're there. I was like, this is kind of strange. So I'm going to go up. I'm going to walk over and just kind of see what's going on. As I start to round the corner, I see Tyler's truck. Tyler's truck's over there. My son-in-law's truck. And I'm like, I think back to when I was that age and I was still in sin and stuff like that. I'm like, dude, I hope I don't catch him doing something bad. This is going to be real, real bad. He's going to be hanging out with his girlfriend or something. There's going to be trouble. We're going to have to smack him. <laughs> I'm glad he's outside the room. I guess they had an IRT call. I'm safe for just a moment. Him and Cole will be out there. So, Oh, no, he's in the back of the room. I'm in trouble now. <laughs> so I'm going to sneak up. I'm going to catch him. Yeah, I'm going to catch him. I forgot he's SWAT, though. Darn, jeez, man, those guys. So, so, no, I sneak up behind the truck. I'm, like, trying to sneak up behind the truck. I'm, like, I'm going to come up. I'm sneaking up. So I go by the window, and I jump out, and I say, what are you doing? And he turns to me, and he has his Bible in his hand reading the Bible, bro. Like, what are you doing? So I was like, I was like, what? You know, so he's there at the river reading the Bible. And I was like, wow, how awesome is that? You know, that a young man just sitting there of his own accord. I didn't have to tell him to do it. I know his dad's, you didn't call him and tell him to read the Bible, did you? Molly, you didn't whip him and tell him he needed to go read it, right? I mean, like, like none of us were calling him and telling him you must do this. or are going to whip you. You know, he was of his own accord trying to dive in deeper and learn who God is and how to apply God's word in his life. And it was pretty amazing to me. I was like, that is awesome. That's not something I was doing at that particular age of my life. And I was like, could more of us do that? How amazing would that be to see that? In the same vein, I got, my son texted mom and about some good experiences that were happening in his life that week. And then Mary Jo texted him back and said, you should read First Timothy. And then he had just texted a picture simultaneously to that, that the Bible was open in the picture and guess where he was at? First Timothy. We live this life thinking that we are in a -a whack-a-mole situation with God. He's waiting for us to do something wrong. We pop our heads up, boom, he slaps us back down. But it's far from the truth. That's not what he has for you. That's not what he's thinking about you. He loves you and wants to spend time with you. And what I've learned is that whenever you open his word, all of a sudden it truly does become alive in your life. So I would challenge you this week to open your word, to dive in. And here's a secondary portion of that challenge. If you're truly trying to study God's word, I would encourage you to go old school and use paper, paper Bible. Why? Because here's what tends to happen. If you're going on your U version on the phone, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You're using the Bible on your phone. You're using the Bible on a smart device. The second you start to go deep, boy, your best friend's going to text you. Bing, that's going to come up, right? They're going to say something that's going to distract you or a work issue is going to pop up on it and you're going to be tempted to immediately go over to that other issue. So if you're truly wanting to spend time with God, you got to take this and go put it in a different room and go get a little bit old school for just a few moments. Does that make sense? It's very hard to really do. We're going to talk more about that next week about going deeper, but it's very hard to go deep here in this, in this kind of a device, right? But it can be super helpful. Technology, no doubt, is helpful. I remember when I first started studying the word, it predated the internet, and we'd have like this concordance that was like this big, this thing called a concordance, and we'd have our Bible dictionary that was this big, and my table would be about to fold under under the weight of those things, and we would have them out there on the table. And now, um, I think even as pastors, there's uh, these different softwares that they try to sell us. One of them's called Logos, and it really has all the bells and whistles. If you're trying to study the Bible deeply, you could buy this Logos software, and it's got every Everything but the kitchen sink, but you know what my old mainstay is anytime I'm preparing a message? How do you think I find the verses? Louder, come on, I can't hear you out there. Come on, you gotta speak up. Google! 
there's this new invention came out like 11 years ago. It's called Google. And if you type scripture and then you say the word, guess what? It will pull it up for you. It's actually a miracle. I don't even use the thesaurus anymore. Like why do I, you don't need it anymore? I mean, it's literally there. So, um, it's pretty easy. So uh, how I use that tool, instead of that big expensive logo software, I literally, I, I'm terrible. So don't feel bad if you're this way too. Like if you tell me, Eric, what's first John chapter five or whatever, I'd be like, I have no clue what you're talking about. Right? Some people are beautiful at memorizing particular verses and knowing, okay, this verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 11 says this. I'm like, I'm clear. You know what Romans, I have no clue what you're talking about. Right? But I can always remember the words for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Right? Most of us know what that particular one is, but if I could type scripture, God so loved the world, boom, it'll show me all the references instantly to where that's at. So if you can remember any part of it, it'll help you find it in the Bible, and then you can go a little bit deeper in your study of God's word that way, right? So I'll often have the Bible open, and then I'll have Google up, and I'll be able to Google it and get that information. So we'll give you more tips and tricks next week about how you can study and meditate on God's word and go deeper as well, because we are in this series called DIY. We have this personal responsibility and this opportunity to put God's word into practice throughout the course of the week where we can learn together, grow closer to him. So we're trying to be super practical during this series. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? 1 Corinthians 2.12. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart his, this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. You are a spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. The Bible is not too hard for you to understand. God will illuminate it in your heart. He will teach you his word that you could put it into practice in your everyday life. All we got to do is open it up in Jesus' name. Would you rise with me? Bow your heads, close your eyes. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here already in this very practical time that we've had together. My last scripture for today says this, James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Lord, our desire as believers is to put your word into practice, not because we think that you're going to whack us if we do wrong, but because we love you, God. We love you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, and sometimes we are so worn out, so deceived, so, you know, just lethargic, Lord. Forgive us for those times that we forget to just dive into your word and know you all over again. Lord, let, our, let those who are stale in here come alive this morning, Lord God. Let them get back into your word. Let them spend time with you. Let it ignite their faith. Would it just be an encouragement to them as they open their word and it comes alive in their hearts and minds? If you're here today and you are in a dry season, man, I want to pray for you because I believe the spirit of the living God wants to ignite your heart today. For those of you who wouldn't call yourself a believer and you're in this place today, but you're saying, man, I want to know more of this Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him. I want to be part of his family. I want to pray for you as well today. So if you are in a dry place and want to rededicate your life to God, or if you are at a place where you maybe want to dedicate your life to him for the first time, I would be honored to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor with all heads bowed and all eyes closed? If that's you, raise your hand up really high and I will pray for you. I see your hand and yours. Is there anyone else in here today? I see yours over in the corner and yours over in the corner over there as well. Thank you, Lord, for moving in this place today. Thank you for those who raised their hand. Thank you for your power and your presence in this place, your power to breathe life. And I ask you to do that right now. We ask you to breathe life, Holy Spirit, over everyone who is in here today. Would you let your spirit loose on the people of Journey Church? Would they sense your presence? Would they know and feel your love for them? Father, we come before you today as a congregation corporately and individually and say, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. 
life. We surrender our lives to you. We surrender our dreams to you. We surrender our hope to you. We, uh, we thank you for forgiving us that we could be part of your family. We thank you that you're a good and loving father who sets boundaries in our path to guide us and direct us and lead us to safe green pastures because you love us. So today we surrender our hearts, our minds, and our lives to you for the first time or anew in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. amen. Give God a little bit of glory. <laughs> two things before we go, just two things. Man, if you made that prayer of faith, come see me after the service and text to a uh, seven day start to 9700 and we'll get some resources into your hands to start your walk of faith.